continuing on then, 11 through 20 here. So this question, we're looking at sulfuric acid and barium hydroxide. And so if you look at the net ionic of that, basically what we have is we have barium and hydroxide, and we have H plus and sulfate. So we have four different ions, but as they mix, what we end up forming is, is we're forming a barium sulfate precipitate and we're forming water, neither of which is going to conduct except for a very minimal amount of the barium sulfate that will dissolve according to its KSP. So what we expect to happen is, is that as the amount of sulfuric acid decreases, the conductivity is going to go down until we reach a minimum, and then as the amount of excess barium hydroxide added goes in, that's going to increase back up. And so D is our correct choice there. The next question is a little bit tricky to answer. This is one that on the National Chemical Olympiads, you kind of want to go through and look at what's the wrong answer. So when I first started this, I saw way 98.1, and I went, eh, it's a little iffy, but then I saw it again and again and again. And so, okay, well, obviously they're doing some kind of weighing. So they weigh the concentrated sulfuric acid into a beaker, and then they add deionized water. So that's a problem because we always add acid. And so this is a safety concern. And if we look at the second one, I believe the same thing. Here we're putting into a volumetric flask was a big improvement over a beaker in terms of accurate measurement, or precise measurement, sorry. But then we're going through and we're adding deionized water to the acid again, so we always want to add acid. So B is wrong. And then we're kind of choosing between these two. So at this point, we go through and look, and C is the one that has the agreement for the correct amount of sulfuric acid, so that would make us suspicious of D. So we're looking at they're putting the sulfuric acid into a beaker for storage, then they're putting it into um, another beaker with some ionized, deionized water, but not enough to make the entire solution. So they're getting it to mix, and they're gonna reduce some of that heat. Then they put that into a volumetric flask and then fill to the mark with deionized water. And so C looks good, but we can double check here really quickly, and they're gonna fill with sulfuric acid, which means they're gonna ignore any mixing volume changes, and so therefore D would be incorrect as well. So C is our good answer there. All right, and this one, I was hopeful and I was satisfied with the answer. So we're looking at something that is reasonably dense, so probably not a gas, and it says it's not significantly compressible, which could describe either a solid or a liquid. So a lot of people might be tended to go to solid here because they are perhaps less compressible, but the reality is when you squish a liquid, really you're just putting pressure that gets transferred around, you're not actually compressing the liquid. So D was the best option there. Here, this question's a little bit tricky, so because we're talking about carbon tetrachloride, I'm gonna leave off the lone pairs for time's sake. And carbon with three chlorines, but then a hydrogen present for chloroform. So, the big difference between these two molecules, for a lot of people, they would see that this is slightly polar and this one is not. This one has no net dipole moment, this one does. However, if you look carefully, the CCL4 has the higher boiling point, which means that this one has the stronger intermolecular forces, even though this potentially has a small amount of dipole-dipole interaction. So even though we would be drawn towards this, the better choice here is the one dispersion forces because we're showing the difference being that this one is better. And the reason why this one is better is because we have more electrons present in this extra chlorine compared to this hydrogen. So having more electrons present creates a situation where we have stronger dispersion forces because we have better polarizability of all those electrons that we can shift around. So C is our best choice there. Okay, here we're looking at the hydrogen bonding. Uh, and so this, obviously not correct because we're looking at an actual covalent bond and it's between a carbon and a hydrogen. Here we do see a hydrogen bond. We have a hydrogen that's been polarized by this oxygen in a way that's going to create that bare proton effect and it's attracted to a negatively charged portion of another molecule. Here in C, we have a hydrogen bond here, but they're pointing to the actual covalent bond here, and so then C is incorrect. So nothing tricky there, and we get B as our correct choice. Okay, the triple point question. So the best thing I can recommend for these is to actually draw out an axis when you do them. And so in this one, we have a triple point, which is at a certain temperature and a very low pressure, well below one bar. And then they say at normal pressure, uh, this is the melting point. Now the melting point is the transition between the solid state and the liquid. So really what we're getting at here is does this line go backwards or does this line go forwards? And then we're gonna have some other curve here between the liquid and the gaseous state. 
So if we look, what's happening is, is that the temperature is increasing very, very slightly. So I'm going to exaggerate that, but basically that means that this line is correct. Now, in a common phase diagram question, we often look at water, which has a very slightly negative slope between the solid and liquid state, and we use that to explain or connect with the idea that ice is less dense than the liquid state at similar temperatures. So the fact that this has the opposite slope means that the solid ammonia is more dense than the liquid. And so that was our choice. Um, you can go through and rule out the other one from there if you want. Um, this one was probably the least dicey of the remaining three, but, but A is your choice based on that slope. Okay, this one, we're just looking at a simple vapor pressure question. There's two key ideas here. The one is, is that we have a mixture of gases. And so when we look at the one liter of the argon gas being expanded to four liters, that one bar is gonna to change to 0.25 bar pressure for the argon. And so then the question is, well, what is the vapor pressure of the acetone? So the acetone says it has a vapor pressure of 0.307. That is, that is not impacted by the actual volume of the container so long as there is sufficient liquid to occupy everything. And so the fact that we're looking at such a large amount of liquid acetone means that we don't have to worry about all of it evaporating and we will have 0 0.307 uh, bar will be the pressure of the acetone. So then our total pressure in the container is this is a combination of those two, which would be C, 0.557 bar. Um, and really the key there is that kind of like as you expand your container, it doesn't matter how much bigger it gets, unless all of that liquid is gone, the equilibrium vapor pressure will remain 0.307 bar. It's only temperature dependent as long as you don't run out. Okay, so the unit cells, if you're unfamiliar with how these work, basically anything that's shared with another unit cell, if we continue stacking these, uh, only gets counted once for each component. And so this one that's shared by eight different unit cells because it's at a corner of a cube, we can't count once for each unit cell, we have to count one one eighth of a time for each unit cell. So the ones on the corner are going to be an eighth, and there are eight of those. One, two, three, four, five, there's one back there that's hidden, six, seven, eight. So that means that there is one cerium between all the corners. Now on the other ones we see on the face side, so that means like this unit cell and the one over here, this unit cell and the one over here, so those are shared between two unit cells, so we have six faces and each one is shared with two unit cells, so that's three more cerians. Now every oxygen, it may not look like it, but every oxygen here is internal to the unit cell. So this is not actually shared between different unit cells, the next cube would have its own set of those oxygens. So there are eight oxygens total, I'm going to put a little comma there, so eight oxygens, so I want to look like a zero. But we have four cerams and eight oxygens, that gives us a ratio of CEO2. And D is our correct choice there. Okay, here we need to translate some things. So we have spontaneous endothermic chemical reaction. Let's go ahead and write those down. So spontaneous means that delta G is negative. Uh, and then we have endothermic, which means delta H is positive. Okay, so if it's endothermic, what's gonna happen is as the chemicals react, they're gonna slow down uh, as a result of an increase in chemical energy. So that means the temperature is going to be dropping. So here when we have both the temperature and something else increase, that's incorrect. Temperature increases, that's incorrect. So we're looking between C and D, and the temperature decreases while the reactant's internal energy increases. So as the reaction happens, think of it kind of like endothermic reaction, the internal energy of that chemical is going up, the chemical energy is going up, and so C would be our best option. We would not want the one where the internal energy decreases. And then the last one on this set, number 20, here we're given uh, three different reactions and we're asked to figure out what the standard heat information for the ethylene is because it's found right here. Okay. So you need to be really careful on signage for this and kind of take your time here. But basically the enthalpy for this whole reaction, the negative 88, is going to be equal to the enthalpy of formation of the three things where it's going to be products minus reactants. So if we look at the product here is this uh, ethanol, 
the liquid ethanol is right here, and that's its enthalpy formation. So we're going to do all the products, so negative 278 minus all the reactants. So our reactants are the gaseous water, the steam, so we've got a negative 242. And then we have this that we're looking for, so we're going to call that X. So you have to be mindful that this negative is going to apply to both the X and the negative 242. So if we start going around and kind of doing some simplification, we have negative 88 equals negative 278, and then let's say plus 242 minus X. So we can combine these two, we can switch this over to here and switch this over to here. Uh, but when we do all of that manipulation, what we end up with is we end up with a positive 52 kilojoules per mole, and that's choice B.